From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. What you just heard was the sound of fighting in the northern Syrian city of Raqqa. Indeed, this week saw Raqqa, the proclaimed capital of the ISIS caliphate, fall to the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic forces composed of Kurdish and Arab forces. After the fall of Mosul in Iraq, this is certainly a major setback for the terrorist group. In the east, Assad uh, government forces backed by Russia and Iran have moved against ISIS in the eastern city of Deir Zur. And Turkish forces have moved into the northern Syrian province of Idlib, seemingly against al-Qaeda's local affiliate Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, but certainly also with Kurdish concerns on their mind. Is ISIS facing real defeat in Syria, or will it simply morph into another form? What is the fate of other al-Qaeda offshoots like Hayat Tahrir al-Sham? What's the best way to consolidate and stabilize towns and cities liberated from terrorist rule? What's the outlook for the Assad regime and for the mainstream opposition? And how will Kurdish ambitions play out? With me to help explain and unpack these various questions are Charles Lister, MEI Senior Fellow and Director of our Extremism and Counterterrorism Program. And Charles has just returned from a 10-day trip to Turkey, where he met with many members of the opposition. With me also is Ibrahim Al-Asil, MEI Fellow, one of the founders of the Syrian Nonviolence Movement and author of a recent article in the Washington Post entitled, Syria Civil War is Far From Over. And with us also, Gunil Tol, Senior Fellow and Director of MEI's Turkey Program. Let me start with you, Charles. Uh, uh, what's the significance of the fall of Raqqa? When, what did you hear from the Turkish opposition that you met in Turkey? Well, on Raqqa, I think uh, the significance is perhaps at this point more symbolic and strategic than it is necessarily immediate. ISIS had withdrawn much of its leadership and much of its foreign fighter force from Raqqa many months ago um, in anticipation of the eventual loss of the city. And where have they been going? Uh, down south and east towards Deir Azor, uh, in Syria along the Iraqi border. It's there in towns like al Mayadeen and uh, al Bukamal that ISIS has been kind of preparing for its last major territorial stand. For sure, in terms of the U.S.-led coalition, the focus of their operations now is very much in Syria. Well, if ISIS has lost Mosul and ISIS has lost Raqqa, those were their two big cities, and they obviously are able to retreat to other places. But still, what is the significance for them of the loss of these major cities? Is, is it significant? Well, it is significant. It, it, it was significant for them some time ago when it was clear they would lose it. The key point here is the caliphate as a territorial entity is coming to an end. And now we're watching ISIS attempt at least, I think successfully in Iraq at, at the very least at this point, morph into sort of a, into operating in a new phase, uh, more as a sort of guerrilla style insurgency operating underground rather than in the open, controlling territory and governing. So we're entering a new phase rather than closing out the previous well, Ibrahim, one. let me go to you. I mean, from a Syrian perspective, how is this being read among Syrians, whether it's regime people or opposition people? Mm -hmm. And how to uh, build on the liberation after all of Raqqa? You know, Paul, in, to, in 2013, I was in Raqqa city weeks before it was captured by ISIS. And now I look at the, the images and I can't even recognize the city. I tried in the last few days to talk to people, to friends that I met in Raqqa, and now they are whether in Turkey or, or in, in other neighboring countries. And I asked them how they feel. One of them, he just said that strangers left and strangers arrived. So from the, the perspective yeah. of people of Raqqa, they don't feel that, they don't have that feeling of liberation. They are happy that they got rid of ISIS, absolutely. But that's not the day that they have been looking uh, forward. Is it because and of the heavy presence of Kurdish forces? Uh, that's one that the of main the issue? reasons, yeah. absolutely. And also because the city is heavily destroyed and also because they have that concern about the future, who's going to govern the city. They don't feel that they have the opportunity now to govern their city and, and rebuild it. And absolutely, that's um, a very big concern because now, uh, as Charles mentioned, uh, ISIS fighters left, but they would be going to, uh, uh, to maybe to the Syrian desert. There are different mountains and just wait for another opportunity to come well, back. Let me ask day. you, in your piece uh, a few days ago in the Washington Post, you emphasized the need to help civil society, particularly in areas that are liberated in order to build something positive out of a very difficult situation. 
how might that play out in Raqqa? Is that a realistic option? It will be difficult, absolutely, and very challenging. But it's important to empower a local council, um, especially to start providing services and security. These are the two most important elements. And these are how uh, ISIS and the Nusra tried to, to appeal to the Syrian people. Well, isn't, by providing the, isn't a council being put in place there? Not yet. It's, I mean, it, it was appointed, first of all. And many people of Raqqa, they don't feel they are represented by that council. Uh, I'm not calling for elections that won't uh, be realistic, but at least to, to try to fight consensus between the local leaders of Raqqa and to empower them and to make sure that the aid goes to the people directly on the ground. Charles, back to you for a minute. Uh, obviously, you see a lot of the people on the U.S. side involved with this, uh, Mr. Brett McGurk and others. What do you, th- I mean, this has been a U.S. objective, uh, certainly during the Obama administration and very much during the Trump administration, to defeat ISIS in Raqqa, at least part of their objectives in Syria. Now that that seems to be achieved, as it were, or being achieved, uh, what are the Americans going to do next in Raqqa or or other parts of Syria? I mean, that's the huge question. I think there is a, a lot of skepticism in this town at the moment as to whether or not there there has ever been that kind of medium to long term planning for what takes place post Raqqa. Our uh, advances along with the SDF south into Deir Ezzor looked like an opportunistic move to compete with the kind of pro-Assad coalition who are also moving into that area more than they look like something that had been extensively pre-planned. My understanding is the U.S. currently has six people, maybe seven, in the city of Raqqa who are looking at issues of stabilization. That's a pretty meager number considering the level of destruction that that city has been. And the U.S. doesn't intend to put resources into reconstruction as far as I understand. Well, as far as we understand, the U.S. position is no reconstruction money whatsoever. What the the new dynamic that we do have in place since the U.N. General Assembly is that the collective Friends of Syria group made it clear that they we would be willing to dangle the prospect of Western reconstruction money in exchange for a more kind of constructive and durable political process for Syria. So there seems to be a maybe we might be interested leverage, as it were. if you follow through with a lot of our political demands. But frankly speaking, in terms of a unified body, I don't see that happening. Um, The last thing I'll say is I have heard that there are several European countries who, despite teaming up with that joint statement, are now nevertheless exploring options Mm -hmm. for putting Well, maybe we'll get to sort of that reconstruction or not issue a bit later. Let me go from Raqqa to Idlib and bring in uh, Gunul. What is the nature of the Turkish intervention in that province and what's behind it? Well, I think Turkey's first priority is to contain, uh, besiege the the Kurdish um, enclave, Afrin, uh, and also prevent a refugee flow, and also to have a say in the political future of Syria. Uh, So that's uh, that's three Turkish priorities. in. So you think the Kurdish priority is first? Yes, certainly. So how will that play out, uh, let's say, you know, geographically? I mean, Afrin is in one angle. Mm -hmm. The uh, Al-Qaeda affiliate is further south. What is the current deployment and how far will it go? And will will they really engage the Al-Qaeda affiliate? Well, Turkey is planning to deploy troops at 14 checkpoints, uh, and that would really uh, help Turkey besiege Afrin from the south. And I think there is a quiet understanding between Turkey and Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, because Turkish Turkey sent troops, and those troops were uh, were escorted by militants from, from the HDS. So I think HDS would not oppose to Turkish deployment that would besiege Afrin from the south. And uh, and in return, there won't be a big fight. So, I mean, let me ask maybe Ibrahim or Charles, what is to happen to that Al-Qaeda affiliate if Turkey is not going to engage it? Do you see the Assad regime taking it on or any other group of forces? So part of the agreement is um, to, to surround uh, Idlib from the south by also allies to the regime and Turkey to, to enter from uh, the north. So most likely HTS will be in the middle and they will just relocate from the, the borders and, and go more to... So for now, a kind of besieged, contained... Yes. ...with no plan that's clear to take them on directly. Yes, and uh, and also it's clear that HTS uh, prefers that scenario where they can just move from the borders. They don't want to be... They don't want to go and confront the, the, the Turkish forces. And probably now they will start changing their tactics to focus more on governance and try to uh, uh, to appeal more to, to the people on the ground. 
to build more connections. Okay, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, so so ultimately, I think what Ibrahim is is explaining here is the the broad spectrum long term Astana agreement that was allegedly made at least. How for, does that for, fit into all for of Idlib? This? And well, this was the idea of sort of almost dividing Idlib into proportioned zones under the responsibility of Turkey in the north. Russia in the south, and then presumably HTS left in the middle. This, in at least as far as I can see it, and certainly considering my trip to Turkey, where I was down on the border talking with all of the groups that were involved in this, that's a long time from now in terms of how pros- you know the prospects for for realizing that. Neither Russia, HTS, or Turkey wanted to get into a full blown confrontation in Idlib. None of them did. The Russians have been secretly meeting with HTS else- elsewhere in Syria for months. This is just beginning to come out. The Turks had been meeting with HTS to negotiate their initial first phase intervention in Idlib. And that's precisely what we have seen up until this point. It's just phase one. And there are many more phases, at least in theory, lying ahead of us. But Turkey might not engage HTS. And yet still, I think uh, the HTS could be weakened because of Turkey's cooperation with HTS, because there are more radical elements within the HTS who are opposed to this quiet diplomacy, this cooperation between HTS and, and Turkey. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that, that, if I can just quickly add, that's the, the, the key element that the Turks, apparently, in, in my understanding, have in mind. So while I was down on the border, I was told by very well-connected sources close to HTS and other Islamist groups that Turkish intelligence has been involved for several months now in financing the assassination of troublesome HTS foreign commanders who oppose this kind of quote-unquote pragmatic negotiating strategy. And Turkish intelligence has been directly involved in Idlib in tapping the cell phones um, and conversations of senior HTS leaderships and then leaking those recordings into the public when they particularly are damaging to HTS's credibility on the ground. And that's already having a significant impact. And I was told that was the key reason why HTS's leader, Abu Muhammad al-Jolani, sought to negotiate with the Turks. Is his big fear is by losing more and more credibility by seeing Russia and Turkey creep into Idlib province, he would lose his invaluable Syrian base. So this was his way of rescuing his own credibility as a leader. Thank you for that, Charles. Let, let me pivot quickly to Deir Zur and uh, Brahim, uh, what's the picture there and how do you see it playing out? So the regime uh, uh, has advanced more. Uh, in Derzor, taking more uh, areas from ISIS now. But of course, they still have their areas there. And also, they are moving more to the desert, where it will be more difficult uh, to find them and to kill them. They might regroup there and change their strategy to find smaller towns or, or city where they can go regroup and try to relaunch. But uh, would you describe again. that the regime with Iranian and Russian support is pretty much winning in the Derzor area? And Slowly, I mean, but slowly, yes. and they yes. have the upper hand. And to what degree are they able to uh, meet up uh, to the Iraqi border, that famous issue of the land bridge and so on, which they claim they already have? I think by time they will be able to do so unless they are stopped. As long as they are not stopped, the regime will keep advancing in that area till they, they just retake all uh, of their resort. Well, since I, I'm, you know, finishing off from day to Zur, I mean, ICE is certainly losing on a number of fronts, and the Al-Qaeda affiliate at least contained and besieged. Where does that put the Syrian conflict, the Syrian crisis uh, today, six years after it uh, you know, erupted in 2011? Has Assad won? Is the opposition, what's the opposition thinking? Uh, where are we in the broader issue of the Syrian conflict? I don't think anybody has won because the conflict is not over yet. I think it'll just change in, in form and go into new phase. Uh, we clearly has two types of, of two Syrias now. Syria under the regime control, where the regime is uh, pretty strong. Uh, however, the state's institutions are very weak and the economy is destroyed. And also the army is very, very weak. And we have uh, militias uh, and warlords uh, everywhere. And then we have areas outside the regime control, which is also still, we still have like around 40% of Syria outside the And where are control. those major pockets? Uh, that's uh, uh, in the north, the whole north, uh, east and west. And we still have uh, areas in eastern Syria around the Zor and uh, in the south in Dara. Also, that's still uh, outside uh, uh, the regime control. So those areas are still open. We don't know who's going to control them. I think the regime will keep trying to conquer and attack any uh, inch outside its control as long as 
uh, unless it's stopped. So by time, it will try to take those areas. And one of the big question is, what if the regime attacks the Syrian Democratic Forces supported by the U.S.? Would the U.S. Uh, step in and try to uh, uh, to defend them, or they would just uh, let them go into another mm -hmm. uh, uh, sure. stage of Very the civil question. war? Charles, you were just meeting with many members of the opposition in Turkey. What do they see their future as? How do they see the Syrian conflict if ISIS is indeed being defeated? What does that mean for them? Well, I don't, to, be, to be honest, I don't know how much the ISIS situation necessarily translates into much significance in terms of the opposition. We're looking at different areas of the country by and large. But for the opposition, you know, one of the things I was surprised about was how the, the kind of lack of negativity from them. I kind of expected them to be pretty distraught at their situation because it is frankly pretty bad. But I think what we're really seeing is the opposition having to adapt, having to adapt to a new phase of the conflict. As Brahim said, the conflict is far from over, but we are seeing a very different conflict emerge. Do you see in the Astana process or any other mediation, any political movement between the regime and the opposition, maybe very indirectly? So this is what I heard from the opposition more than probably anything else on the political track, is that Russia has begun to very seriously pitch behind the scenes a new political process, either in Astana as an evolution of that military track or somewhere new. Um, the Russians have been talking about um, guaranteeing a power-sharing agreement with the opposition in which Assad would stay for some period of time, but ultimately his power would be eroded. And again, I was quite surprised that a lot of the opposition going across the ideological spectrum were potentially very interested in this idea. So it, this is really a Russian design. The whole Astana process of de-escalation and everything else was Russia's design. And I think that is probably what we're going to start to see emerge in the public Perhaps one, two, three months from now, it will still take some time for this behind-the-scenes talks to mm -hmm. to continue. To but, but that's the that's the new dynamic. I think we'll see starting to starting okay, to develop. Okay, thank you, Charles. Uh, uh, Gunil, I wanted to ask you about the Kurdish situation in the north. Obviously, the Kurdish situation in Iraq has erupted with the referendum, fighting over Kirkuk. In a way, it might be you know be careful what you wish for. You know, a very successful Kurdish efforts in. Iraq lead them into trouble, very great successes for the Kurds in northern Syria might be leading them into trouble with Turkey or even the regime. What's your view of how things are developing, particularly between Turkey and Syria's Kurds? Well, I think Turks, they've always been concerned about Kurdish advances, but I think, and also what happens after Raqqa and after Deirizu, what happens to U.S. cooperation with the Syrian Kurds. And I think Turks should uh, should be relieved uh, looking at the, 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 the stance Washington has taken on the Iraqi Kurds. So I think the question... Uh, How so? Could you explain that? Well, uh, they basically, Washington abandoned the Iraqi Kurds mm -hmm. and they lost Kirkuk, they lost uh, everything that they've gained after 2014. So Barzani is now cornered, and the, the basic Turkish concern was that that uh, Washington was supporting an independent Kurdistan. So now I think looking at Syria, they should they should feel comfortable that so the that, Turks that, should the, feel comfortable, comfortable that that, yeah. that uh, the Syrian Kurds will be facing the same fate, uh, and, and Washington will not be there. Uh, to support the well, Kurds. Ibrahim, how do you see the future of the relationship between the Assad regime? And the Kurds, you mentioned, you know, the um, possibility yeah, of the clash. Um, um, the regime uh, uh, was clear at different uh, points that they will attack the Kurds when, when they have the opportunity to do that and when that uh, becomes the priority. And quickly, I just want to also comment on the Astana and, and political process. Maybe also it's time to start talking again about Geneva because Astana is limited in definition because it's only for the military aspects and not even all the armed groups are there. So it's time to, to re-talk about uh, Geneva where the political opposition has a say there, the civil society is there, and there is uh, a broad a uh, discussion about Very the future point. of Syria. Very good point. Brahim, I'm going to give you the last word. Two words on talk of reconstruction. What is, what, is that real? And what, what does it mean? Um, I don't think there will be any uh, uh, funds that we send any fund to the Syrian regime because it's going to be weaponized by the regime. However, there are people on the ground that they need to be supported. There is a way to do that, to send uh, the aids directly to people on the ground in areas outside the regime control, to stabilize that, those areas that will help to uh, uh, to prevent ISIS from uh, going back, and uh, also to help people to, uh, to, to start rebuilding uh, those areas. 
Well, the ups and downs and the travails of the Syrian situation are going to be with us, unfortunately, for a long time to come. That's all the time we have today. I want to thank Gonul, Ibrahim, and Charles uh, for sharing your insights uh, today with us. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in to a Middle East Focus, MEI's weekly podcast. And if you'd like to join the conversation about today's podcast, join us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Middle East Institute. See you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.